Awesome. Thanks so much. Uh, happy Monday, everyone. We are on the final home stretch here of the legislative session for the 2024 year. Um, excited to be with you today to provide a mid session, although very much at the end of a short session, but this is the middle point as far as the work goes, I guess. Uh, a midpoint update uh, on the legislative session and the impacts to DCYF. I am joined by my colleague, Sarah, who I'll let introduce herself. Hi, everybody. I'm Sarah Emmons. I'm the Deputy Chief Financial Officer here, and I'm covering for my boss, Renee Newkirk, who is on vacation this week. Excellent. So Sarah and I are going to go ahead, we're going to go to the next slide and guide you through the highlights and lowlights, but mostly highlights of uh, the, the middle point of the legislative session. Um, this is really intended to be an update, sort of what we know to date. I will say now, and I will say again, and we will say again uh, multiple times throughout, what you're, the information we're presenting today is all works in progress. Nothing is final, uh, although one bill I'll talk about is nearly final. Um, nothing is final. Budgets are not final. They're very much in the throes of negotiation. We still have 10 days left of the legislative session, and in those 10 days, we expect to see hundreds of bills make it through their final two hurdles, um, and three budgets come out uh, uh, and be worked on, as well as some initiatives get heard and voted on as well. So. Lots is going to happen in the next 10 days uh, for those of us that are down here in this arena. Um, we'll go through uh, updates today. We'll go through bills, high level sort of bills that are still in flight that have an impact to DCYF and our clients. And then we'll talk and we'll also talk through the budget highlights of the proposals of the House and Senate operating budgets. Um, I will say there's a lot of content that Sarah and I will cover. We will move quickly and try to be as thorough as possible, recognizing we may not get to every uh, every nuance or every part of every item. There's a lot here. Uh, we're in webinar format. There's a Q&A or question and answer uh, place on your screen. Please feel free to use that to type your questions. Sarah and I both will respond to them either um, verbally during parts of the webinar, or we may type the answers and then those are there for folks to see. Uh, so that's a little bit about the operations. Sarah and I will sort of tag team and bounce back and forth, but, but depending on topics. Um, I'll cover bills and some of the fiscal stuff, and Sarah will focus on uh, large parts of the budget. So with that, with that, we can go to the next slide. For folks who have joined us previously, this is very familiar. This is a uh, the best way we have decided as an agency to sort of articulate the intersections and roles of state agency land, that's us, uh, governor's office and OFM, those, are those folks across the street, and the legislature who conveniently comes to town every year in January and stays for 60 or 105 days. So this is just intended to map the roadmap of how that process works, uh, responsibilities and roles. We're, we're at that uh, yellow box part of the process, which is uh, we're right in the middle of the legislative session. We expect that to, to conclude here in, the, in 10 days, and then we'll pivot to implementation and building next biennial set of priorities. No rest for the weary around here. You can go ahead and go to the next slide. I think it's important to ground us in the real in the realities of what uh, what guides our authorizing environment and guides the on ramps as we head into each and every legislative session. This legislative session is a supplemental year. So last year they were in town for 105 days and they passed a really big and expensive budget. They passed a lot of bills and that really set the guidance and the operating uh, uh, guidelines and framework for the state for two years. Supplemental sessions are intended to be modifications, tweaks, finish things that maybe didn't make the deadlines last year or weren't quite, quite ready. Um, it is not intended to be the time of new and innovation uh, or big or big concepts and ideas. Uh, short sessions move very, very quickly. Uh, deadlines are tight. Um, there's not a lot of time to dig in. And so it's really about sort of well-baked things, moving through adjustments to the budget, modifications, et cetera. You'll see that if you've attended these webinars over the last couple of years. Uh, DCYF has been very fortunate to uh, experience significant investment and significant change in our policy landscape and our framework, how we do our work. Um, this year, it feels a bit smaller. It feels like a true supplemental year again. It hasn't felt like that in a long time. Uh, so you'll see that as we go through. Um, so another guiding reality for us this year is we are implementing tons of things. Every corner of our agency has experienced significant change in policy, in the policy landscape, in workload. Um, in investments, in dollars passing through the agency, et cetera. And that really does have an impact on our bandwidth 
and where we're at uh, in, in work in flight and we are a human system. So you add more change to humans, it does get hard um, to, manage, to, to manage quality. And so that's where we're at. That really guided our, coupled with it being a short session, our slate of asks this year that were very uh, small and strategic and intentional. I'll turn it over to Sarah to talk a little bit about the budget and economic realities for the state. Thanks, Allison. So just kind of further context for the um, fact that this is a, a relatively modest, maybe supplemental um, budget session. The February re revenue outlook was, was slightly higher than what was assumed in the governor's budget, so the November update. Uh, but this was basically offset by a higher adjustments at maintenance level for things like forecasted caseload adjustments, inflation, um, and the like. So this just kind of further adds some context that both houses really had a, a relatively constrained resource environment to work with at policy level. Great. Go ahead and go to the next slide. So our format is how this is going to work, because we have sort of a, a, a slide like this that will cover any given set of bills in an area. And then we'll move through... Uh, slides that look like the next slide you'll see that'll that'll be the budget investments for sort of the buckets of work inside DCYF. We will then talk about some of the investments in other agency budgets that impact us, our clients, uh, the work we do. And Sarah and I will sort of tag team through this over the next uh, 50 minute journey. Uh, so this slide overviews a number of bills that are continuing to move through the legislature uh, this year that impact largely the child welfare space or families in that prevention or in the child welfare bucket. Um, I will highlight a couple. I am not going to go through details on all of them, but we'll highlight a couple. I think worth noting um, 5908, which was a bill that was actually introduced last year and didn't make it through the deadlines, but is uh, on its way this year, actually moving out of the appropriations committee today. It's second to last stop on the journey. Um, that changes the realities for how the extended foster care program is implemented from an opt-in to an opt-out, uh, waives the requirement that young people must participate in one of the five categories to receive their monthly stipend. Um, and it also asks the department to make some recommendations on establishing an incentive payment program to continue to incentivize young people to participate in one of those uh, five programmatic categories that are, are laid out by the feds. And so this will have some impact on a positive impact on clients, more resource going out the door, and impact on sort of our focus as an agency, how we serve this population. Um, I also will highlight 6109 briefly here, and then we have some slides that walk through some of the investments in that. But 6109 is really about uh, uh, a response to how we support children and families grappling and impacted by the fentanyl crisis in our state, both with a focus on child safety and family support, uh, supporting families. So this bill takes a three-prong approach, uh, the first being clarifying in law the risk uh, that fentanyl can, uh, the lethality of fentanyl can pose to young children. Uh, it directs the courts to give great weight to the lethality of highly potent synthetic opioids as defined and lim not limited to, but including fentanyl, um, when considering whether or not to remove a child. It also has an expectation and resource for training on the, in the judicial system uh, through the judicial grant program and other training opportunities, resources for AOC to really incentivize and build capacity and muscle around training the judicial system on the dependency bench. bench. And finally, it invests in a suite of services aimed at prevention and intervention to support families. And we'll go through those in a little bit. We have a slide on those. Uh, the last bill I'll highlight on this slide is 2224, which is related to a risk assessment tool pilot. This codifies some work that DCYF is currently doing to update, redo, redesign our risk assessment so it is more dynamic and less static as we think about what families need, both in looking at their, at their risk, but also looking at their strengths and assets and then being able to tailor uh, service referrals and better resources to meet those families in mitigating uh, risks or challenges that may exist that could potentially lead to uh, impacts to child safety. And so we're excited to see that being codified and really create an opportunity for ongoing dialogue with the legislature in the space. Um, with that, we'll go to the next slide, which will lay out the format for the, the budget overview slides, and I will turn it over to Sarah. Thanks, Allison. So I'm going to talk about a few investments in our prevention services area. So first is independent living. Um, the governor's budget provided funding for two items within independent living, and the Senate budget fully funds those, those investments. So first is about $1.1 million in funding for seven independent living staff, including adolescent, adolescent transition, well, transitional living liaisons. 
And these were originally funded in the 21-23 budget with one-time funding. Uh, the Senate budget makes those the funding for those staff ongoing. The Senate budget also provides about $2 million to backfill the declining federal CHAFE grant. This is funding that's sufficient to maintain the independent living program at current levels. The House also provides that backfill funding, but takes the approach of scaling the independent living staff from seven down to four. There's funding in both budgets for Rising Strong Spokane, uh, an organization that has experience administering the family-centered drug treatment and housing program for families experiencing SUD. This was also funded in the governor's budget. Now I'm gonna talk about a couple of house-only investments. Uh, commercially sexually exploited children receiving care centers. As, uh, as background, DCYF has about a million dollars in the base. Uh, I believe it was the 21-23 biennium mm -hmm. uh, where that funding was yep. um, first granted. And uh, the House budget provides 694000 in FY25 only to supplement this funding. Uh, so one-time funding, and, and again, it's to contract for two receiving care centers as established in statute. Next slide, please. Uh, Youth Village's Life Set, again, another House-only item. The House fully funded the governor's budget item, which restores funding that was um, scaled slightly in the 23-25 biennial budget as well as allows the department to expand this program further in FY25. And then uh, the House budget also provides funding for a rate increase for family preservation services. This is an FY25 only, and it's sufficient to implement about a 20% rate increase beginning, in, or beginning July 1st, 2024. It's not included in the Senate budget. Next slide. And Allison, I think you said this, we can take questions during the yeah. hazard yeah. presentation. Um, a few child welfare investments. So both the House and Senate budget provide funding that the department requested for the DS settlement. Uh, the Senate budget fully funds the governor's, governor's budget level uh, for, for 10 family, team family time decision-making facilitators, quality assurance and shared planning meetings and plaintiff fees, um, administrative funding, stakeholder engagement, um, some fiduciary, fiduciary support. The number looks a little bit lower here, but that's a technical issue. Some of the funding has moved at our request to our program support budget. So Senate fully funds, and then the House scales the administrative funding by about half a million dollars and removes one of the fiduciary staff that the department had requested. Uh, it also provides one-time funding for hub homes in FY25 only. I don't know. Uh, DS is the name of a settlement in which DCYF is under. It's actually the initials of a uh, plaintiff. So we will not uh, name that as they were a minor, but it is the name of the settlement. Is the DS lawsuit and the DS settlement. Thanks, Allison. And, and that relates to DCYF's required end of the use of offices and hotels for children in our care. Um, oops. Question? Oh. <laughs> You're welcome. Uh, both budgets also fully funded the governor's item, which was an EPS rate increase to 13,400 per bed. That begins um, next, beginning FY26. I think it's actually beginning next year. And that should, that might be a typo. Is that right? This? Yeah. Uh, I will check. Yeah. I think it, they both began FY25, but we will double check that and I will throw it in the chat. Um, and then both both budgets provide funding for um, DCYF's request for an increase to the basic foster care rate. The Senate takes the approach of fully funding this rate increase beginning FY26, so July 1st, 2025. The House um, provides an additional increase on top of what the department asked for for children between the ages of zero to five. So slightly higher rates. And they, as the governor does, begin the increase in FY25, so July 1st, 2024. And again, this would be an increase to base base rate. So the, the the higher levels are kind of steps provided on top of this. So every rate will effectively go up with this funding. That is a typo okay. on EPS. Those are July 1, 2024, beginning in fiscal year 25. So we'll get that updated before this gets posted. Thanks, Allison. Next slide. Okay. You again. Perfect. So as I indicated, Senate Bill 6109, which is moving through the process, includes a number of services uh, that are uh, service funding for DCYF and other uh, parts of the state system. 
uh, we'll highlight the DCI, DCYF ones here. Um, there are two services that were, uh, the, the public health nurse pilot, I don't actually think is currently in the bill language, but is funded in both budgets and, and is sort of lumped in this category of fentanyl response and supporting children and families. So prior to the recession, there was an approach uh, engagement across the state, well, in some areas across the state, where uh, public health nurses would go out with CPS investigators and sort of offer a multi-team response to a CPS investigation. That went away, phased out and went away uh, during the recession era and has never come back online. And as we were sort of living into the realities of the growing fentanyl crisis over the last number of months, this was an idea that actually came from the field to say, you know, having a public health nurse be available to, to go out and, and be on some of these investigation and investigative visits was helpful, helpful for the family, different messenger, et cetera. And so this provides resource for DCYF to stand up a pilot. This is certainly not scalable statewide at this funding level. But to stand up a pilot and sort of lean back into this service to see um, if it is something that you know is helpful and beneficial um, and makes a difference. So we will be uh, working towards that. The second is uh, contracted safety plan participants. So when a family has engagement with the CPS system and there is need for a safety plan to be in place, meaning there's some support and services and other adults around to keep that child and that family safe, um, often a family's natural community becomes part of the safety plan. Relatives, neighbors, grandparents, uh, other community supports that, uh, that a family may have. Um, for some families, those natural supports don't exist or don't exist as robustly as necessary. And often that can have an adverse impact on removal for some families. And so again, as we were talking about response to fentanyl um, and, and some of the challenges we're seeing, an idea from the actually field was to, um, build out some pilot and contract pilots to say, uh, what if we had contracted safety plan participants? So for some families where safety threats could be mitigated with a safety plan and additional adults in the home, but natural community doesn't exist, we could help bolster that community for that family, keep that family together, that child in that home and do so safely. So this is enough, some funding to, to pilot that concept um, and refine it and see what we can learn from that. The next two items I'll talk about together, also they're on different slides, home visiting contracted slots and childcare contracted slots, really similar in their vein in that what we're asking for here is to buy capacity with our community-based home visiting providers and our community-based childcare providers for them to hold capacity until we have a direct referral of a family who is potentially engaged in a, in a CPS intake or investigation where childcare or a home visiting program may be identified as part of a safety plan to help mitigate. Uh, the realities of what's going on. Um, often what happens now is, you know, a need like childcare is identified for an infant in a, in a family. And although that family may be eligible for subsidy, they spend uh, weeks and weeks and weeks calling for a space, thus potentially exacerbating the safety threats that may exist. And so both in the home visiting and the childcare space uh, contracted slot pilots, what we're looking for is what the resources will do is purchase capacity. So families can be directly referred in and have that care or that home visiting program available immediately, not have to be on a wait list. Hey, Allison, I think there might be another typo. And again, you can blame your deputy CFO here. On no, the fiscal no budget. blame. Um, the safety plans, I do not believe were funded in the Senate budget. Oh, okay. Sorry, everybody, they're, they're, they're a house only item, but they are in the bill. They are in the bill. Yeah. Yes. Interesting. Okay, thank you for flagging that, Sarah. Go ahead and go to the next slide. So I talked about contracted slots. The last piece here is the intercept evidence uh, based pilot program. So uh, Youth Villages, which runs LifeSet, which Sarah talked about a little bit ago, also has an intercept model and there's some funding included in the Senate budget and languages in the bill to uh, start an intercept pilot, which is an intensive case management model for children um, uh, and families zero to 18, child welfare, juvenile justice involved uh, or juvenile justice involved uh, and uh, grow that, explore with that program. Um, so it'd be a pilot uh, in a couple geographic locations. Go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, so this is a list pivoting here. So those are some of the highlights of investments in the child welfare and prevention space. This is a list of early learning bills that are still in play impacting the agency. The first I'll make note of is 1916. This is agency request legislation, our only piece of agency request legislation this year. Uh, that makes a technical change to align practice realities with billing opportunities for early intervention for supports for infants and toddlers providers, uh, meaning they can 
claim for a child the first month in which their services begin rather than waiting till um, the, the next month or the month previous to their service beginning requires a law change and will result in a bit of increase. This bill is uh, slated to move out of the fiscal committee in the Senate today and then should it be on its way to the floor. Uh, has had strong bipartisan, almost, I think, unanimous support all along the way. That is a good technical change and improvement for our early intervention providers. Also, three bills contemplating working connections, child care, and uh, approved activities and eligibility. I'm going to talk about 2111 first. That bill is on its way to the governor, has passed the House and Senate. This bill is a technical bill that simply reorganizes in a more uh, coherent way the working connections, child care statutes. As you all, uh, as many of you know, there have been many changes to the child care eligibility statutes over the last couple of years and co-payments and who's eligible and when they're eligible and activities. And so this bill sort of reorganizes all of that together. So technical in nature, no uh, no impact other than we'll probably have to redo some rulemaking <laughs> policy updates, uh, but reorganizing in a more digestible way. 1945 contemplates working connections eligibility. It establishes that families who are receiving uh, basic food benefits, so SNAP, are also income eligible for working connections. It does not create categorical eligibility. There still is an expectation for approved activity, but uh, that SNAP benefit then is verification for their income eligibility. Um, it also does that for early ECAP effective. Both of those are effective November 1, and then would make families who are eligible for SNAP benefits or, or food benefits for ECAP in uh, August of 2030. 2124 expands uh, working connections eligibility uh, through approved activity adjustments to um, uh, in, uh, for families that are participating in early Head Start or early ECAP, that would be counted as their approved activity for working connections eligibility. So still would need to be income eligible, um, like we are, but those would be their activities. Many of them are. This also uh, makes clear in the law that providers, teachers in ECAP programs are eligible for working connections, childcare as well under 85% SMI. There was a bill that passed last year that uh, Created eligibility uh, for teachers in working connection or in licensed child care. Some ECAP providers are not licensed. And so this goes back and clarifies that ECAP staff, ECAP teachers are eligible um, under 85% SMI. 75% SMI. Thanks. Yeah. I can't remember. It's, it's not everyone. It's not universal. There is an income cap and threshold on it, but I can't remember if it's 75% or 85% SMI. Anyway. Um, and then a couple other bills. Uh, 5774, uh, it directs DCYF to establish finger, fingerprint capacity in offices throughout the state. Um, excited to build that capacity, learn, do a pilot there, learn, and, and hopefully build that capacity out more readily. Um, and then 6038 will waive the licensing fees, initial and ongoing licensing fees for child care providers. This was happening during the pandemic uh, and went away. I'm excited to see that move this year as well. Um, and then 2195 is a technical bill make, or makes minor modifications to the health program or the living facilities trust. And if we want to go to the next slide, we will go through uh, some of the investments here. Um, the first is a uh, summary of the early learning investments in both proposed budgets that do rate adjustments. So both the House and Senate event invest in non-standard hours and infant rate enhancements with different approaches for non-standard hours the Senate invests more robustly and takes that current bonus uh, from one third, that current rate from $135 to $300 a month, and then the House takes it to $150. On the infant rate enhancement, the Senate goes from a $90 rate enhancement to a $300 rate enhancement for infant service, uh, and the House goes from $90 to $180, both effective July. And then you see slightly different variations on the ECAP. Uh, rate increase. The Senate takes the governor's approach by doing a 6% increase for school day and a 10% increase for working day. The House modifies, dials that slightly, a 5% for school day and a 9% for working day. Uh, now I'm going to go through, if we're going to go to the next slide, a series of investments. What you'll see is the Senate has taken a deeper approach into a few items. The House does a sort of much more, um, you get a thing and you get a thing and you get a thing, a little bit more peanut butter and a variety of things. I am not going to go through all of these in detail. There's provisos in the budget that are pretty straightforward and agency detail. Um, but to do a sort of high level clip, the, the House directs a number of contracts out the door for technical support, ongoing professional development access, language access and translation, 
uh, additional shared services, all of those first four are funded in the house budget and are intended to be contracted out with entities, um, uh, namely Imagine Institute, uh, to do and carry forward some of that work. Uh, the Senate budget, Senate budget funds our decision package on coordinated recruitment and enrollment uh, resources provided for folks doing uh, in the field, uh, doing supporting coordination of recruitment and enrollment for early learning programs at the local level. The House budget also expands our investment in early childhood mental health consultation. That was the one word I needed to add to that slide. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> infant early childhood mental health consultation. We'll get that added and go, go ahead and go to the next slide. I want to flag on the first one here, the Cherish program is actually a child welfare focused program. We have a relationship and fund some of this work now. This is an increase to their budget. This is uh, services provided in the home for children with developmental, developmental disabilities or delays who are also in the child welfare system. That likely moves into the child welfare budget should it remain and be funded. Uh, three other pilot, three other contracts here, uh, two in the house budget focused on sort of municipality uh, planning and workforce development, uh, one in the Senate budget focused on inclusion, uh, mentorship and inclusion training uh, for uh, creating inclusive practices in early learning settings. Go ahead and go to the next slide. Who talked about chair? Hmm? Do you want to talk about chair? Uh -huh. I mean, let's move on to yeah. uh, the next slide here is the last two on the early learning side. Um, Imagination Library is expanded by expanded by uh, one million dot one point two million dollars in the House budget for fiscal year twenty five, and then the Senate budget includes a feasibility study to provide care for non standard hours in high demand professions, law enforcement, health care, uh, etc. So some direction and resource for the agency to study and make recommendations on how to grow uh, child care access there. I'm gonna take a breath and a drink of water. A reminder, if you have questions, do you mind? Yeah, okay. Um, Jessica, can you move on to JR? Thanks. Um, so to, to cover JR, um, the first item relates to a class action settlement um, that the department faces related to hearings for providing hearings for JR youth who are moving to or from D to DOC from JR or from a community facility to an institution. The House budget fully funds the governor's item that uh, this was at DCYF's request to create a hearings unit, and the Senate scales the FTE in that package slightly. There is also funding um, in, uh, in both budgets for body scanners that are compliant with DOH requirements, always a good thing, at Echo Glen and Green Hill. Oops, we have a question. I don't see what that is. They did not. So this... Senate funded. Yeah. yeah. So good question on the transitional, on the coordinated recruitment. I also want to be clear. It's bigger than TK. That's why it is not called TK. It is coordination and recruitment and enrollment for all of early learning. Um, the House takes the approach of funding the DP and the ESD regional coordinators. This, uh, Sorry, the Senate takes the approach of funding the DCYF, ASP, and the ESD's regional coordinators. We'll talk about that in a minute. The House provides some resource to OSPI for navigation and staff support there, but it does not appear to be uh, funded in that budget. Yeah, sorry. No problem. Uh, moving along, so in the Senate, the Senate budget provides funding for anti-bias training uh, related to gender responsiveness. I believe this is a contract that's required on a one-time mm -hmm. only basis, not included in the House funding. There's funding in both budgets for additional temporary enhancements for Echo Glen security, contracted security, the Senate budget fully funds this item at the governor's budget level. Um, this fall after governor's budget development, DCYF had new information about how long and what this security package would entail and made an additional request, which the House fully funds at $17.9 million. There is funding in the House budget for juvenile block grants for, to implement evidence and research-based programs um, in this area at $1 million in the House and no funding in the Senate. Next slide, Jessica. In terms of JR Capital, again, DCYF had a request for security enhancements, um, basically completing the fence that's underway at Echo Glen, as well as a master control um, to make sure we can operate the fence. This is fully funded and some, some lighting and other improvements. This is fully funded in the House budget and reduced um, in the Senate budget. There's funding in both budgets for um, HVAC upgrades at Green Hill School. Well, we can go back to that one. Keep yes, going. No problem. Um, oops. Oh, <laughs> There's funding for uh, for HVAC upgrades at Green Hill School, 
And there is also funding um, for the Echo Glen uh, school roofway walk <laughs> school walkway roofing and lighting project, fully funded from the governor's item. Do you want to address that question now, Allison? We'll go back to it after. Okay. We'll let you finish program support. I'll do in staffing. I'll do okay. it when we transition. Yeah. yeah. Next slide. So there are two items in our program support area related to critical technology needs. The first is our comprehensive child welfare involved uh, comprehensive child welfare information system. Um, this is the the hopefully the beginning of, of more funding for um, for that system. The governor's budget provided twenty five million dollars to uh, initiate the procurement and initial stages, and both budgets scaled this to twenty million dollars. Uh, there's another item related to the replacement feasibility for the replacement or, or updates to our social service payment system, which we use to pay child care providers, among other uh, folks. And the um, Senate fully funds this, this feasibility study and staff to kind of manage and, and turn, turn the study results into a procurement. The House takes the approach of removing funding for everything but the contracted study. So scaled a bit. Next slide, Jessica. And then there are two notable staffing investments for DCYF. The first is that both budgets provided full funding for the governor's budget item related to staff safety and supports. Um, again, this is funding for FTE to oversee uh, and implement contracted mental health supports, primarily for staff facing chronic stress, traumatic incidents, um, uh, critical incidents, and then some staff for safety as well. And then there's a uh, assignment pay as a house only funding. This is for um, assignment pay that DCYF is already um, paying to social worker twos in training. Um, this is bar a bargained item, again, underway in FY24. The house provides funding in FY25 only for this item, and the Senate provides no funding. You want to answer the question now? Yeah. So before we go to the other agencies, I'll just take this question. I arrived late, so perhaps you already addressed it when focused on early learning. What is the status of the ESIP bill? Has it been fully funded? Same question for Cherish. Uh, the ESIP bill, I did address this. The ESIP bill is in ways and means today awaiting executive session. It was funded in the House budget. If it um, if it moves out of the Ways and Means Committee today, it will go to the on the list to bills to be considered in the Senate floor and need to pass off the Senate floor by Friday. Uh, the Cherish funding was fund included in the House budget. As I noted, that is largely a child welfare program um, as it serves children in, uh, involved in the child welfare system and may move to the child welfare budget should it be fully funded, uh, but, but is in the House budget uh, currently. Uh, can you talk more about capital versus operating funds for Echo Glen and what the total amount DCYF is looking to get funding and uh, capital and operating? Yeah. So the capital uh, the capital investments are $5 million. And they, Jessica, if you want to go back a couple of slides, the capital investments are $5 million. And I'm not sure who you asked that question, but if you also want to send me an email, I'm happy to send you. I have a much more detailed analysis of, uh, of this, <laughs> of exactly that question in my email that I'm happy to forward to you. So feel free to send me an email or add it to the chat and or the Q&A or the chat and I'll get it to you. Uh, but the capital investment is that 5.56. That's to, to finalize, to finish the fourth wall, if you will, of the fence through um, and around the, the wetlands. It also creates, as Sarah indicated, that centralized uh, entry point as well as redoes the parking because the fence being completed will remove some parking. The operating budget is all one time in fiscal year 24, 25. No ongoing funding there, as is the capital. But um, and is for uh, temporary and short-term enhanced uh, perimeter security measures, lights, uh, guard towers, uh, manning the, uh, having a person at the entry gate, et cetera, additional foot patrols uh, through campus, et cetera. Um, so that's what those, uh, that's what those investments are. And again, feel free to follow up with email and I'm happy to send you a more detailed overview that has all the numbers broken out by, by fiscal year uh, operating versus capital and, and a lot of information. All right, we can skip ahead, go back to um, the other agency. So now keep the questions coming in the chat. We'll field them as we go. Um, we are in the Q&A. We are now going to move through and they are uh, green uh, because they are other agency investments that impact our, our providers, our clients, our families, um, the agency, but worth noting. So in early learning, uh, folks may recall in the space during the pandemic, there was a zero cost health insurance premium coverage program through the Health Benefits Exchange or HBE under HCA, the Healthcare Authority. 
Uh, that went away, that sunsetted last year and providers were moved on to other, offered the ability to move on to other plans. For some providers that meant their premiums did go from zero to uh, high rates. And so the house includes a proviso uh, to go back to reinstating that zero cost premium or premium assistance for uh, providers who may now have premiums because they're on a different, uh, a different health plan. Uh, the State Board for Community and Technical Colleges has given some resources to uh, provide staffing at the community and technical colleges to support uh, folks who choose to go through the certificate pathway to meet their education requirement, to help them navigate that system, maximize the existing scholarships, both early achievers, opportunity grants, other scholarships that exist to have their education both paid for, but be supported in that process. Um, and then, as I noted, the Senate budget includes coordinated recruitment and enrollment investment at the ESDs, funding the early learning regional coordinators at the educational service districts. That money flows through OSPI. I think that that, that item is actually in the House budget. Not, is it? Yes. It's, okay. Yeah, not, we'll change that. Yeah. Go ahead and go to the next slide. Uh, capital, uh, the first one there is capital in the Commerce budget, the early learning facilities fund. Both budgets invest. Uh, to buy down the list of projects as happens every year and not surprising uh, when Commerce puts out their grants for the early learning facilities fund both the capital and the minor both the competitive grants and the minor renovation there is always more demand than resource available and so there is a current list of projects that are ready to go but the Commerce does not have enough resource for and so both budgets uh, invest some there they take uh, pretty significant differences between early uh, between the competitive grants there um, and then both invest in the minor uh, the House budget also includes a proviso at Commerce to contract and implement a pilot program for on-site or near-site child care for construction workers. And then the Insurance Commissioner is directed to do a report on the feasibility of anal analysis of expanding the definition of essential, essential worker. And one of the things they're to look at in that is child care providers, child care workers. So that's great. Go ahead and go to the next slide. Other agency investments impacting the prevention and child welfare space, additional resources, <clears throat> excuse me, were given uh, for the implementation of a uh, 1186, which is the um, a prenatal substance exposure, uh, and uh, that is funded in the Senate budget. Uh, the Shelter Care Early Engagement, or SKEEP, program, which provides social workers at the outset of a shelter care a uh, hearing in the dependency space was a uh, pilot was funded at OPD. There was a bill earlier this session that contemplated that. That bill did not pass. DCYF was contemplated in that bill. DCYF is not contemplated in this proviso, nor do we have any direction in our budget around this. And then OPD also had an ask, the Office of Public Defense had an ask to have concrete goods resources for their, uh, that their, their attorneys and social workers would have access to to provide to their clients. And so they, you see a bit of funding invested there. Go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, Complex Kids, this is, uh, I think, an exciting uh, addition to our service array across the state. This interim uh, property became available at the Lake Burien previous Navos campus to lease that. DSHS has secured a lease there. DCYF will continue to lease one cottage back for our receiving care and our uh, care that we have been doing there. Um, and this, these provisos provide DSHS with the direction and funding to stand up a new service line uh, a new placement option, a new residential service option, voluntary residential service option to serve youth uh, uh, with uh, 12 and older with, uh, or 13 and older, excuse me, with um, co-occurring or, or complex needs. So youth who have an identified developmental delay disability or um, maybe on the autism spectrum disorder, uh, autism spectrum layered with a behavioral or mental health, behavior or mental health challenge. Often these young people, they're in the care and custody of DCYF experience, great placement exception. Um, and for, and for some of the young people who uh, folks have likely seen in the news or heard about being boarded in hospital emergency rooms or hospitals that are really not an adequate placement, but our state currently doesn't lack uh, the this type of setting. And so this will, uh, small, phased in, pilots uh, be able to stand up and learn how to serve this population, which is not having their needs appropriately met currently. Uh, there's one proviso that directs the work at DSHS and then a proviso for DCYF to be a partner in that work. I'm gonna go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, these are just a couple other agency investments related to the juvenile rehabilitation space. There was a bill that did not end up passing the session, but was converted into a proviso that directs JLARC, the Joint Legislative Advisory Review Committee. I think that's the yeah. acronym. Uh, audit. Audit yeah. and Review <laughs> Committee. Thank you, advisor was not the right word. Um, to, uh, oh, it's right there in the box. To 
look at JR and this and the proviso outlines a lot of detail around operations, safety, security, programming, contemplating uh, you know, what is needed and necessary given the, the population changes that have occurred since the implementation and passage of JR to 25. Um, and then the uh, construction training program uh, evaluation, labor and industries does an evaluation of the construction training program for incarcerated individuals in JR is named in that and we're a partner in that. And with that, we can go to the next slide, which is simply our contact information. Why no money monetary asks to complete the PACE modules? Is there already funds available with expanded community pathway? Great question. I don't know the resource availability off the top of my head available for PACE, but at this point when uh, DCY have submitted a number of decision packages and we didn't go over those today, some of that had to do with shared service and professional development support. Um, my understanding is there is PACE availability still. You could potentially see something in the biennial ask. Um, but I don't know, there is ongoing funding already in fiscal year 25 for training both in scholarships to access the certificate program and for PACE or the community-based modules that was, we have base funding for that. What we highlighted today were things above and beyond, things that were new, that were not sort of status quo or operational. Um, and there is funding uh, for professional development attainment in the biennial budget. That concludes the formal content that Sarah and I have. We'll hang out. We have a little bit of time. We'll hang out for a few minutes and see if folks have other questions. Feel free to use that uh, Q&A feature. Can you say a bit more about how a family would get referred to the designated home visiting or child care contracted plus? That's a great question. That's really largely an implementation question. I do not feel smart enough to answer that question. <laughs> um, I. I just articulate what we need and go get the resource for that. Um, uh, that's great implementation question and more uh, more to come. <laughs> Marisha, you're making me laugh out loud. You know, I get nervous that we're going to run out of time because there's so much good stuff to cover. Uh, I do I do speak pretty fast. I need to work on that. Yeah. Someone should just write slow down all over. We this should took tap an, to this it. This took an hour this morning, but somehow it only took me four minutes now. <laughs> As folks are hopping off, uh, we'll hang out for a few more minutes, but thank you all for joining. Feel free to type questions in if you have them or reach out via email. Uh, thank you all for joining today. I know you have a lot of choices to make in your day. We appreciate you uh, hopping on.